Hey guys. All right, so this is what causes equilibrium to change. So you're going to be able to illustrate, meaning you should be able to graph this, and then you should be able to explain um, the effects on price and quantity when there is a supply or demand shift. So rather than read this, I just want to talk to you about it, guys about this. When you draw your demand curve and your supply curve the first time, we know that this is equilibrium. So it's $300. If demand shifts, like maybe the number of buyers increases or somebody's or uh, the income has increased it, increased, it causes the demand to shift to the right. So now that we have two demand curves crossing one supply curve, we can't say that $300 is now our equilibrium price. It's now shifted to $400. Okay. So look at what the question is asking you. If it's saying, what is the original equilibrium price, it's where D1 and D2 intersect. If it's telling you that something has happened where the number of buyers has increased, what is the new equilibrium price? You just simply draw the new demand. And then there you go. Look at where D2, S1 intersect, and that's your new equi equilibrium price. Okay. Um, it's the same thing. Maybe instead of increasing, maybe it's like the number of buyers has decreased or people's income has decreased or there's a fad people are done with this thing right it's going to shift to the left all right supply does not change in this case the cause of the change in equilibrium price is based on demand okay it's not on price though it's on one of the shifters of demand same thing happens for supply okay demand is going to be the constant it does not change something has happened to supply number of suppliers has increased right um, maybe it's the cost of uh, resource prices has fallen. So my supply curve is shifted to the right. Well, originally where D1 and S1 intersect, that was my equilibrium price. However, now that supply has shifted to the right, my new equilibrium price, which is based on demand curve one and supply curve two, that new price is $200. Okay. And it can be reversed as well. Maybe, um, taxes has increased. So we've gone from supply curve one to demand curve one, which was uh, $300. Boom. And now because of taxation, we've got uh, $400 as my new equilibrium price. That's what the sellers are going to sell it for. Okay. Remember though, wherever the two intersect, supply and demand, that's our equilibrium. In this case, the equilibrium has changed. It has nothing to do with price. It has to do with, in this case, Supply, the supply curve has shifted, in this case to the left, in this case to the right. This is demand has shifted left or right. And that's what's resulted in a change in price. But it's the shifters, whether it's demand or supply, that's important. So demand and supply, they change in the real world all the time. You go to the store and you see fixed price usually on something, okay? But behind the scenes, what economists and people in business are looking at are all of these things that are causing um, changes. Remember, it's not a change in price that's based on um, uh, where the demand and the supply curve meet. That's the equilibrium. It's based on these shifters. You live in Michigan, right? In Michigan, people leave in the fall and go to Arizona and Florida. That means that there is a shift in demand to the left. Okay. Um, and that affects everything. Gas prices, uh, food prices, whether or not a restaurant is open or a hotel, stuff like that. Um, if you think about Michigan in the summer, right, all of those people who left come back, but then people also come to Michigan to do things like vacation. So that means that the number of buyers shifts to the right, and this is going to impact uh, price. So if you've ever been to a place like Grand Traverse or some other place that um, is uh, dependent or at least in part dependent on um, tourists, the prices are different there. They're higher usually, especially like if you were to travel, like I live on the east side of the state. So like I live by this place called Port Sanilac. It loses half of its population in the, the winter. It gets all of its population back and then some in the summer, especially around like certain holidays, 4th of July, for an example. A bunch of people 
um, come there to watch the fireworks, stuff like that. The prices of gas, the prices of milk, the prices of pretty much everything are higher in Port Sanilac. However, if you travel, I think it's like 15 miles inland on M46 to Sandusky, the price of gas goes down, the price of a gallon of milk goes down, the bread, okay. So it's not because of its location per se, it's because of its the number of buyers in Port Sanilac allows the price to be higher, okay? So that's an example of real world. Now, supply and demand can change on the same graph, okay? Don't, don't freak out. You have your demand, you have your supply, where they intersect, that's my equilibrium. If supply shifts to the right, maybe it's subsidies, and then demand shifts to the right, maybe it's number of buyers, where uh, D2 and S2 inter uh, you know, cross, that's my new equilibrium. So this was my original equilibrium. After my shifters, this is my equilibrium. Now, how do you determine what is the cause of the new equilibrium uh, price? Well, what you do is you, you literally just look, which has moved more, supply or demand? Demand has moved about four times what supply has. So in this case, when you're looking at what is responsible for the change in equilibrium price from $300 to $400, it's based on demand, shifters of demand, okay? So why does it matter uh, if price is at its equilibrium level? Well, think back to what we learned, which is when things are not at equilibrium, if they're above the equilibrium, that means that there's a surplus. If it's below the equilibrium, that means there's a shortage. When it's at the equilibrium, everyone's happy, okay? If you're a supplier and you're above the uh, equilibrium, this means that you have more products than you can sell. This can be bad, but this could be worse. And what I mean by that is if you're supplying eggs or corn or wheat or pork or something, um, that stuff can go bad. You can put it in the freezer, you can grind it up into flour, but like, you know, it still can go bad. And so if you cannot sell it within a certain amount of time, it's a complete and total loss, okay? You're not losing a little bit of money. You're not like going from $15 down to 10, you're going from $15 to zero. So this is a big deal because remember, at the end of the day, a firm looks at, this is my total revenue. This is my total cost. If my total revenue is exceeding my total cost, I'm profitable. If my total cost is exceeding my total revenue, I'm taking a loss. Once you take a number of losses, you end up losing your business, okay? That's the reality. And then when you look down here at um, shortages, you know, sometimes shortages are great. Uh, if you think about it, because if you can buy something and there's a shortage of it, you can resell it at an inflated price. Great for you. However, if there's a shortage of something like insulin, people are dying. Okay. If there's a shortage of the COVID-19 vaccine, this means people can't get it, which means they can contract the, the virus and they can die. So shortages are, are bad. So we want to keep things as close to the equilibrium price as possible. But as you can see, when you graph these things, I mean, it is all over the place because things are constantly in flux. I mean, you have to take into consideration variables like the weather, things like the number of, of buyers, people's income. I mean, there are so many things that can impact um, supply and demand. Remember, it's, and this is what's was kind of amusing to me, but like, when you looked back, when you learned in chapter four and chapter five, the law of supply, and the law of demand, it said price and quantity. So if for supply, if price goes up, then quantity supplied goes up. Those are the days. Um, or demand, if price goes up, quantity uh, demanded goes down. Now you have to add the different shifters. Sometimes only one thing is shifting, meaning either demand is shifting or supply is shifting, or supply and demand can both be shifting at the same time. This is why when you're in business, I mean, there is a lot of work that goes into figuring out like what is the, the price, okay? And I think another way to look at this is, is this, price is a signal. So let's go with, I make sandals. I'm a supplier of sandals. Something is going on where demand has shifted uh, to the left. 
And so this means that my price that I was selling my product for, I'm now have to sell it at a lower price and I'm selling less of it. So if I'm in the sandal sector, I can see that demand for my product is falling and that the price for my product is falling. And that means that the total revenue is falling. And so that means that my profit is also falling. So sandal producers have to cut production of sandals. Okay. Demand for sandal workers, the people that are making this product is also going to fall. Their wages are going to fall, or at least they don't rise. And this means that fewer workers are needed. So this means the potential for unemployment. However, if I'm paying attention, I'm looking at the signals, I make sandals. Those are not in demand. However, boots are. There is a shift in demand for boots. I can take my workers or I can hire more workers. I can keep wages the same or increase wages, but I can look at the demand for boots, right, is rising. So then that means I can start to produce boots, meaning uh, output increases. My revenue, my profits will rise. Uh, prices are going up because this is the initial price. Boom. Demand for boots rises. Okay. So the Wellington boots sector has increased. Uh, as a company, you have to know the market. You have to, um, you also have to like, you have to diversify. You have to be willing to, if like, if the only thing you can make is sandals, then in this scenario, you either have to be able to make it at this price point until things turn around or you go out of business. Or if you can make sandals and you can transition some of your sandal workers to making boots, you can remain uh, highly profitable. Okay. So diversification is super, is super important for any business. In this case, it's, you know, sandals and boots, but it could be something like you sell ice cream, right? Ice cream sales go down in the fall and the winter and then they increase in the spring and the summer. But if you can offset the lack of sales of ice cream with by doing something like tanning, right? Having tanning booths. If you can sell tanning, that can offset the loss of the, um, of the ice cream sales. That can keep you at a more stable level of revenue. So price is the signal. So sellers are, uh, they react to uh, changes in demand and how do they do that? Well, they look at the price, okay? They don't literally go out and like ask people like, hey, uh, would you be willing to buy boots over sandals? No, what they're looking at is the price. If the price of boots are going up and the price of sandals are going down, and you can make both products. It should just be a natural transition. But price is important because prices is how buyers tell the producers or the sellers like to produce less of that good like the price is going down, okay? Where when the price is going up, buyers are telling sellers that they want to produce more of that good, okay? So this is kind of like the point where chapter six, where you add supply and demand together, where you can see that like the law of supply and the law of demand, right, are too simplistic for the overall economy. Because like, if you look at this, it says when price goes down, right, buyers are telling sellers to produce less of that good. But you guys know that when price goes down, buyers want to buy more of it. The thing that is, is like how many pairs of sandals do you need, right? When you, and this is what's important about remembering the law of diminishing uh, marginal utility. Having, you know, one pair of sandals is great. Two pair of sandals, eh, it's okay. But do you really need 13, right? So there's this whole interaction that's going on here, okay? It's sort of like if you remember back at, uh, I think it was a couple of, it was at least three chapters ago, the circular flow of economic activity. It's a whole system that's involved. It's a whole ecosystem. And there's a lot going on there. Okay. When you're looking at one individual part, it's relatively simple to understand. But when you're looking at the overall um, system itself, you can see the level of complexity that's involved. And it's the same thing here. I mean, this is much more complex than, you know, just a demand curve just a supply curve or demand curve and supply curve add together. There are shifters involved. There are changes in price. There are changes in quantities. Okay. But it's not beyond what you can do. It's just, you have to think about like, why am I doing this? And what is, what is the effect of this? Okay. So 
what happens to price and quantity when supplier demand shift? I mean, I personally think that like you can probably just um, graph this out and that's all you really need to do. But like if you would like to, you can also use this. So this is like up here is supply up here is, or on the side is demand. And so we're looking at like if there's an increase in demand, but there's no change in quantity supplied, then what ends up happening? Price goes up and quantity goes up. Okay. And so what this is showing you is, is it's the interaction between um, demand and supply. In this case, uh, there's no change in demand, no change in supply. In this one, there's an increase in demand, but there's no change in supply. Or there's a, a decrease in demand, but there's no change in supply. Okay. Some of you might not be able to understand this, and that's totally fine. You don't have to use this. I'm just giving you this as, as an option, okay? Like, this is something that is useful on the cheat sheet if you understand it. If you don't get this, then just graph it out. All right, you have two videos, supply and demand, and then there's... I'm whoop, the sorry. At this stage. And then there's the market, okay? So you should now more fully understand markets and supply and demand than you have at any point up at this point. So that's the part of chapter six. Thank you.